these are the gifts that are yours from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's that time again. It's that time in the service where we have just sung the sermon hymn. We have confessed our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. And we look in our hymnals on page 158, and it says that now is the time for the sermon. And so that's why we do this, right? It's time for Pastor Young to talk. It's time to hear some words. Get through this part of the service so we can get on with the service. Why are we here? Why are we at this point in the service sitting and listening? Why am I up here talking? Why have I prepared a sermon not only for this week, but for every week? What is the purpose of preaching? Now, I indeed enjoy hearing from you after services. I enjoy compliments. Pastor, great message today. Wonderful sermon today, Pastor. I really enjoyed your sermon today. You preached good. You kept my attention the whole time. Yes, these are all nice compliments. I'm glad you listened, I'm glad you heard, and I'm glad you thought it was good. Although I must confess, after almost every sermon I preach, I realize it is far from the greatest sermon ever preached. I always realize there's something I could have said better, there's something I could have said more articulately, there's something that could have gone better with the sermon. I will never be accused of preaching the greatest sermon ever preached. And that is not my intention. But what does it mean when you say you enjoyed the sermon, or you liked the sermon, you appreciated the sermon? What is it that you heard, or what is it that you were hoping and expecting to hear in the preaching? So again, I ask you, why am I here? in this pulpit. What is this portion of the worship service called the sermon really all about? Well, first I would start by telling you what preaching is not, or maybe is not completely or necessarily. Preaching, first of all, is not an extended Bible study. I am not simply trying to teach you about some aspect of scripture. I'm not just trying to enlighten you as to some of the nuances of that particular scripture. That is what Bible study is for. And certainly parts of that exist within the sermon. But for a more in-depth look at Mark chapter 1 verses 29 through 39, I would invite you to Bible study. And we can discuss that if you wish. The sermon also is not meant for entertainment. It is not meant for me to practice my skills as a stand-up comedian. It is not my job to fill the sermon with a bunch of stories and illustrations and all sorts of stuff about me. No, rather, the sermon should be about Christ. That is the purpose of the preaching. I was told once that a lot of non-denominational preachers will preach for 45 to 50 minutes, sometimes up to an hour. But if you take out all of the, quote, fluff, all of their jokes, all of their personal anecdotes, all of their stories, and you get to the actual meat of the sermon that has to do with Jesus, a lot of times the sermon would only last two or three minutes. It is not my job to be an eloquent speaker or to entertain you. No, the job of the preacher is something different. And so what is it? It is the proclamation of Christ, who Jesus is and what he has done. Preaching is the word of God for the forgiveness of sins. 
It is an absolution. It is what Jesus says about the sinner to the sinner. Your sins are forgiven. A preaching sermon should contain the full sternness of the law, the condemnation of the law, and then the full sweetness and comfort of the gospel. Listen to what scripture says about preaching. In Romans chapter 10, Paul writes, How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. You hear that? Preaching creates faith through the ear. Yes, in the ear, faith is created. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Preaching is not about being a good speaker, necessarily. It's not about my gifts as the messenger, but rather it is the gift of the message itself. Not words of eloquent wisdom, as Paul says, but it is the power of the cross of Christ on display for you to hear, for you to believe, and by it, for you to be saved. Our gospel reading today then also speaks of preaching, where Jesus says, Let us go to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Jesus says his whole purpose, his whole mission in being sent is to preach. But if we look at the rest of the chapter, it looks like he's doing other things, right? Look at all that Jesus is doing. He is healing the sick. He goes to Peter's mother-in-law and drives out her fever. And then he goes to a man oppressed with demons and he drives out those demons, and then more demons, and more demons. This seems like a running theme in Mark's Gospel. If we go on beyond our reading for today, continuing into Mark chapter 1 and 2, it says that Jesus healed lepers, he healed a paralytic, he healed a woman with a bleeding disorder, and then he raised a young girl, the daughter of a man named Jairus, from the dead. Certainly, Jesus is doing more than just preaching, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, driving out demons, raising the dead. But he says he was sent to preach. So what is it that he came to do, really? Is this really all that Jesus was sent to do? Just to preach the word? Are these healings, these casting out of demons, these miracles of raising the dead separate from his preaching? Are they distracting him from his true purpose? Or are they precisely the result of his preaching and included in his preaching? Yes, this makes us rethink about preaching altogether, doesn't it? It makes us think about it this way, that Jesus preaches against the fever of Peter's mother-in-law, and his preaching heals her. Jesus preaches against the unclean spirits, against the demons, and they are cast out. Jesus preaches against leprosy, paralysis, and other afflictions, and his preaching causes the leprosy to be healed and the paralytic to be restored. And then finally, Jesus preaches against death and raises the dead to new life. 
Hebrews 4, verse 11 says it this way. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God, the preaching of Christ, is living and active. These are not just words, folks. This word does something. This word performs. The word of Jesus, the preaching of Jesus, actually does stuff. His word performs action on the hearer and has an effect. And so if this is the case, maybe our words after church can be transformed into something else. I like the sermon today, Pastor, becomes, Pastor, I believe the word of God was delivered today. The time for pastor to talk in our order of service turns into the time for me to receive Jesus. Or the comment of the sermon really made me think today turns into the sermon gave me the comfort of Christ. It healed me. Yes, indeed, you have been healed, brothers and sisters in Christ, even now by your hearing. You have been healed of your sin and iniquity, which has been forgiven and cleansed. Your sickness, your demons, and your death is cast out by the word of God. And this healing comes not by any clever wit of mine, not by eloquent words of wisdom, not by entertaining jokes or emotional speaking or personal anecdotes or stories. It comes by the cross of Christ. You see, it is on that cross that Jesus preached the greatest sermon ever, ever given. Yes, it is on that cross where Jesus spoke the words, Father, forgive them. It is finished. And these words were not just words. They performed action. When Jesus bowed his head and prayed, Father, forgive them, your sins were forgiven. When Jesus gave up his spirit and said, it is finished, it truly was finished. All the temporal threats of fevers, sicknesses, viruses, and disease, all powers of devils and demons, even the power of death was finished. His conquest was complete. His victory was certain, and his mission was accomplished. Yes, Jesus says his mission was to go to other towns and preach there also, to bring them his word and everything that comes along with his word. The kingdom of God has come, and the king reigns through his word. And today, that word comes also to you with healing and comfort. It is Jesus' mission to give you the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And when you see in faith all that he has given you, through your ears, and through his body and blood placed in your mouth, you would agree that Jesus' death on the cross is the greatest sermon ever preached. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, do not despise this preaching or this word of God, but hold it sacred, gladly hear and learn it. It is Christ's gift to you. It is where Christ gives himself to you, and it is living and active. It performs action. This is why I preach. This is why you listen. And indeed, this is why Jesus has come. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.